Well, good evening. Welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Say what you will about cable news. It's not a subtle medium. You don't need to do a lot of guessing about what the anchors think. They tend to tell you over and over and over again. So what's on their mind over at MSNBC and CNN? Well, let's see. During yesterday's marathon Michael Cohen Stormy Daniels coverage, talking heads on those channels used a single word 222 times. The word impeachment. Impeachment territory. Impeachment. Ultimately, potentially an impeachment. 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 A giant step toward impeachment. Impeachment. Immediately impeachment. 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 And there's certainly enough to impeach the president right now. Impeachment for the high crime of being shaken down in an extortion scheme by a porn star girlfriend. At least it was his own money, by the way. When members of Congress make payoffs to avoid sex scandals, and they do, it's usually a taxpayer expense, but whatever. The left is now strongly opposed to paying off former sex partners. Though don't tell Bill Clinton that. They're opposed to anything Trump is for, and they're for anything he's against. That's the formula. Sometimes it works out for them. Sometimes it doesn't. Often it's embarrassing. For example, MS-13, one of the deadliest criminal gangs in the world, never popular, and yet once Trump criticized that group, Nancy Pelosi came out of nowhere in support of MS-13, on theological grounds, of course. Having sex on camera for money was, well, since time began, considered disreputable. And then Stormy Daniels attacked the president at a press conference, and now that she's a member of the resistance, porn is noble. Just last night, the left, which says it strongly opposes bigotry, they're always telling you that, defended racially motivated property seizure because the president said he opposed it in a tweet. We'll have more on that in a minute. You see what's going on here. It's Pavlovian, and it raises an interesting question. If the left exists only to oppose anything that Trump does or says, then isn't Trump in control of the left's message? And if that's true, how long before the president takes a hard stand against, I don't know, human trafficking or for motherhood, just to see how the Washington Post responds? It could be highly amusing. Mark Stein is an author and columnist. He joins us tonight. So, Mark, why is Trump not completely in control of Brett Stevens' brain or the entire primetime lineup at CNN? It seems like he is. I actually think he is. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a story, uh, a rather grisly story out of Florida about uh, cockroaches who call into your ear and lay eggs in your brain. <laughs> and actually, uh, and actually uh, don't laugh, Tucker, because it's happening uh, to uh, famous media personalities every morning. They wake up and they find that Trump has laid eggs in their brain and these little Trump roaches are running around inside their heads driving with them nuts. The MS-13 one uh, was a classic thing. These are guys who use machetes on people and chop, uh, chop them up in very brutal ways. Uh, and he called them animals. And immediately uh, everyone said, oh, you can't, you can't compare MS. It's outrageous to dehumanize these people. And then uh, it's taken to the next level and they uh, start presenting them as actually nice young lads in the neighborhood uh, who ride around on bicycles and have part-time jobs after schools. <laughs> uh, they're straight out of Leave it to Beaver, except for the tattoos and machetes. And, uh, and, and Trump manages to do that every time. Uh, as you said, it's, it doesn't even have to be anything big. It can be a tweet about Aretha Franklin, and they go bananas. Well, last night, I mean, let me just say, I know a number of South Africans, some of them very liberal for whatever it's mm. worth. I've never met mm. one who will defend the government in South Africa. It's corrupt. It's, it's no. clearly racially motivated right. in the way that it acts. Trump tweets a question about the behavior of the South African government last night, and all of a sudden he's a bigot for questioning it. And the left finds itself on the same side as Ramaphosa. Like, do they really want to be there, do you think? No, and actually it's ridiculous the way they try to object to what he's saying. Uh, you know, some of the people who didn't like either your report or uh, the president's tweet were saying, oh, well, you know, farm killings are at a 19-year low in South Africa. The fact that farm killings is a category in South African crime statistics tells you what's going on. And just for the record, even as they're tweeting this rubbish, just last night, a 70-year-old woman was beaten to death 
of on course. a South African farm. And they lie about uh, those stats. I mean, the idea that right. we take the stats, the politically charged statistics released by the South African government at face value, oh, well, I'm fact-checking with their statistics. Like, what are right. you, a moron? I mean, right. that's... No credible social scientist would take that at face value, obviously. No, no. And, and actually, you should always listen very carefully, Tucker, when someone's telling you to shut up. Because that's well, what do. the left is doing. Uh, and uh, Ann Coulter was on your show a couple of nights back. Ann gets a bit twitchy because the president isn't doing more as she sees it. But in fact, actually by talking about these things, by actually saying uh, it's necessary to expand the conversation and not let yourself be shriveled into the tiny little corner of uh, things that the left will permit you to talk about, uh, that's actually quite important. Uh, MSNBC and CNN just think we should, uh, they talk about celebrating diversity, but in fact they want to enforce homogeneity. We're only exactly. allowed to talk about the same things and only allowed to have the same uh, perspectives on the, on the same things too. And, and God bless the president uh, for occasionally wanting to talk about something MSNBC doesn't want to talk about. Exactly. Shut up and obey. That is their program. Mm. Mark, thank you for that. Insightful as always. Thanks a lot, Tucker. So we just said last night on the show, we highlighted what is a remarkable and very sad story. More than a quarter century after the end of apartheid, South Africa once again becoming a place where an entire group of people is targeted for discrimination and violence on the basis of their skin color. We oppose that, obviously. It was wrong 25 years ago. It is wrong now. It is wrong wherever and whenever it happens. So we call the State Department to get their view of what is currently happening in South Africa because America's moral leadership still does matter. They told us they didn't care. Confiscating property without compensation is fine, they said, in effect, <clears throat> because South Africa was, quote, a strong democracy, whatever that means. Pretty shocking. We're not the only ones who found that answer hard to believe, by the way. The Washington Post insinuated today that we made that up. Unfortunately, we did not. The president saw our segment last night, and he tweeted this response to it, quote, I have asked Secretary of State Pompeo to closely study the South Africa land and farm seizures and expropriations and the large-scale killings of farmers. We should say that we did talk about the land seizures on the show last night. We did not address the killings that he referred to. We did mention the threat of violence. But in any case, today, the State Department elaborated on the president's tweet. Here's part of it. I should mention that the expropriation of land without compensation, our position is that that would risk sending South Africa down the wrong path. Uh, we continue to encourage a peaceful and transparent public debate about what we consider to be a very important issue, and the South Africans certainly do as well. So, I mean, that was kind of tepid, I guess. It's not going to solve the problem, but it's basically good news. Pushing back against racial discrimination is always worth doing. And yet, for some reason, a reason no one really explained, luminaries in the media disagreed. They were offended by that. In an Orwellian turn, various news outlets suggested it was somehow racist to oppose the racist policies of the South African government, even Nazi-like. Watch. He goes to race. And what better way than to give this neo-Nazi propaganda that white farmers are being killed in South Africa when, in fact, that is not true, not based on them being white. So show that clip to anyone who knows South Africa, who lives there, and see how they respond. They'll laugh bitterly. It's ludicrous. It's, an, it's a lie. The president of the country, Cyril Ramaphosa, has pledged to change South Africa's constitution in order to legalize the seizure of property without compensation. That's currently being debated in the parliament in South Africa. Even now, the government is trying to confiscate two game farms after the owners refuse to sell at a fraction of the market price. Everyone in the country understands what these are. They're racial attacks. Okay, say defenders of the South African government in this country. But previous generations in South Africa, under the apartheid government, also seized land on racial grounds. And by the way, that is absolutely true. They did do that. And it's one of the reasons that so many decent people in this country and around the world opposed apartheid. Apartheid was awful and wrong. Things have changed, though. Now our elites endorse the idea of a racial spoil system. And that's the scariest part. It's far more ominous than whatever the corrupt and incompetent government of South Africa is doing. Our ruling class now believes in collective punishment. That is the opposite of justice. Nobody is alleging that individual farm owners in South Africa stole their land. Instead, the claim is that people who resemble them did, and that's enough. Our elites see no problem with that standard. That should worry you a lot. If you got mugged, how would you feel about imprisoning someone who just happened to look like the mugger? How about the mugger's children? Should they be punished too? If those sound like insane questions, that's because they are insane questions. 
in the West, we punish only the guilty. We do not punish their descendants or everyone with the same hair and eye color. For more than 200 years, pretty much everybody in America agreed on those terms. Now, the people who run our country aren't so sure. Increasingly, they think that generational guilt seems like a fine standard. But where does that end up? For a preview, let's go back to South Africa. Julius Malema is the leader of the country's third largest political party. He's one of South Africa's most famous figures. Here's what he said two years ago about murdering people on the basis of their skin color. Watch this. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I'm saying to you, we've not called for the killing of white people, at least for now. I can't That's, guarantee the future. Yeah, but I mean, you'd understand somebody watching that, especially as it gets shared on Twitter, they freak ah, out. It sounds like a genocidal ah, call. Ah, cry babies. Malima hasn't become any more moderate. He's become more radical, and not coincidentally, he's become more popular. Here's Malima just a few months ago. When you want to hit them hard, go after a white man. They feel a terrible pain. We are starting with this whiteness. We are cutting the throat of whiteness. Malima, by the way, is not a fringe figure in South African politics. He's a pivotal figure in South African politics. He saw the president's tweet last night, and much like the Washington Post, Malima was offended by it. Notice how he makes certain to blame Jews for good measure. Watch this. This is from today. Donald Trump is not saying anything we have not heard from white people. There's a group of white right-wingers who are being trained by Jews in Pretoria to be snipers. Only death will stop us. Not Trump, not poverty, not sanctions. That right there is what our ruling class is now defending. It does make you wonder about their motives. Christian Witten is a former State Department senior advisor under President Trump and George W. Bush, and he joins us tonight. Christian, great to see you. Good to see you. So there are many levels here. South Africa is the most modern, really the only really modern country in Africa. It's a great country. It's worth helping them not slide into Zimbabwe territory. But there's also a moral level. Why is it so hard for the State Department to say, no, that's wrong. We're not for that. Yeah, you have clientitis here, and this happens in what we call the regional bureaus at the State Department. You have an East Asia Bureau, in this case an Africa Bureau, and too often they end up representing the interests of the government, the foreign government to us, as opposed to the real job, which is to represent our interests to them. You saw that in the original statement out of the State Department, very weak, defending South Africa and completely glossing over the murder happening there. Why would, I mean, look, anybody... One of our producers is married to a South African, South Africans working here, of, of all political backgrounds. But you talk to anybody who lives in the country, and the first thing they'll say is, well, why would you take statistics from the government at face value? That's insane. And yet our State Department does. Why aren't they more sophisticated? Or do they know that they're yeah. false? I don't think they know. I think there's a lot of ignorance about this issue. You know, this is one of the sort of unauthorized victim groups around the world. We have authorized ones that we're allowed to be concerned about, um, you know, the uh, various minority groups. But when it comes to the president or other people, the vice president defending Christians in the Middle East, even defending Muslims in Burma, defending Christians in Burma who are also beleaguered, 60 churches burned there, uh, defending Muslims in China, these are not the ordinary victim groups that the left cares about. And that flows over to our State Department bureaucracy at times. Times, unfortunately, and so you see just not a lot of regard and interest for this. We also don't have a political ambassador yet down in South Africa, which means that our representation down there, frankly, is weak. Yeah. And by the way, just to be totally clear, I, I, I'm very wary of getting in, too involved in the internal dealings of any, of any country unless it directly benefits the United States. So I'm not calling for any dramatic action, but people do listen to what our State Department says, and it seems like it would just be low cost to say, you know, the United States doesn't think that you should punish people on the basis of their appearance. Also, we can just tell a very, very uh, topical historical lesson, if you will, and we can, without you know anything with the military, with intelligence, just be honest about this. What's going on in South Africa right now happened next door, nearby in Zimbabwe, right. uh, beginning around 2000. Robert Mugabe going after white farmers there. The same stuff where it's a combination of political intimidation and then violence by thugs. They push more and more white farmers out. That actually has led to food shortages in Zimbabwe. It became the poorest class. country on planet Earth for a while because of that. 
So is the president, do you think, going to keep up with this issue, or is it the criticism, do you think, going to slow him down? No, I think, the, you know, across the board, the president has been very good about some of the forgotten people, not only here in the United States, but people who around the world are beleaguered. I mentioned Christians in the Middle East, really no one aside from Trump um, speaking up for them, not even the Pope, not anyone like that. So I think you're going to see this. And, um, you know, Pompeo has been, by necessity, very focused, North Korea, Iran, Syria. Right. This is, as you point out, not an area where there are fundamental U.S. interest at stake, but, but it's, it's worth one saying that's been brought something. to his attention. We're yeah. actually doing a segment later in the show with Marco Rubio on Muslims being persecuted in China, because it's not, and I know the reaction is, oh, this is tribalism. It's not, actually. There's a principle here that's worth defending, and we're going to continue to, and I hope the president will. Christian Witten, thank you very much. Thanks, Tucker. Great to see you. Molly Tibbetts tragically became the face of illegal immigrant crime here in America, a problem those in power deny even exists. The truth is different. We'll investigate after the break. <music> Iowa college student Molly Tibbetts is dead. She was killed by an illegal alien. It's another reminder that our governing class refuses to enforce our country's laws. When they're called out on that, they deny they're doing anything wrong. Some say we should be grateful that illegal aliens enter this country freely because they are smarter, less dangerous, and generally more impressive than regular Americans. Last night, we spoke with Alex Narasta from the Cato Institute in Washington, who argued that despite breaking the law just to enter the country, illegal immigrants are far less criminal than people who were born here. So if you want to take a look nationwide at convictions and incarcerations, of people well, by immigration says that's a much states, better way to do it, and then you get a no. A, a but, 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 well, it, 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 it would be. It. Hold on, it would be. Uh, it would be. But we don't have those data. The most comprehensive data we have are from the federal system. And no, so that's when not true. forty-four, that's not, per, well, that's it, true, it is Tucker. true actually. Not every state keeps those data. I, I know the answer the to this Texas question. Does. The state of Texas actually well, that does one, record uh, one, convictions uh, 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 by immigration okay. status, and Texas one is a great state has a lot of illegal immigrants. Peter Kirstenau knows a lot about this subject. He's a lawyer, a U.S. Civil Rights Commissioner, and the author of the book Second Strike. He joins us tonight. Peter, thank you very much for coming on. So it seems like a simple for... question to answer, because it's a data-based question. To what extent do people here illegally add to our crime problem? Do we know the answer? We have a pretty good understanding of it, and it's significant. I heard your lead-in, and you're absolutely right. You have to disaggregate data because the various organs of both federal and state government consciously avoid getting this data. You could probably find out, for example, how many Norwegian prisoners there are in Minnesota, but it's difficult to disaggregate data with respect to illegal aliens, but it can be done. Um, there's something called the State Criminal Alien Assistance Program, and you can extrapolate from that and get pretty reliable data. Now, Alex is very knowledgeable, and that's why it's puzzling that he won't acknowledge the overwhelming amount of data that shows that legal aliens not only commit more crimes, at, at a higher rate, that is, than lawful residents, but more serious crimes at a far higher rate than lawful residents. And we're not talking about a little bit. He conveniently mentioned Texas to claim that the homicide rates among illegal aliens is 44% lower than that for lawful residents. He chose the one state where it is true that the homicide rate is lower for illegal aliens by 15%, not 44%. But if you look at every other state, it's significant how much more, not just the homicide rate, but every other serious crime, rape, aggravated uh, assault, you name it, so much more. For example, in New York, 27% of incarcerated illegal aliens are incarcerated for murder, not jaywalking. We did a study, Carissa Mulder and I did a study with respect to five states, five, five largest states, to see how many uh, illegal aliens were incarcerated for homicide. Texas, New York, Florida, uh, California, and Arizona. 5,400 illegal aliens are incarcerated for homicide. That's just homicide. There are over 300,000 illegal aliens incarcerated. We're talking billions of dollars in incarceration costs and all other kinds of costs. And the base that open borders advocates often steal is that they don't count the millions of offenses and crimes committed by illegal aliens, such as 
document theft, social security, driver's right. licenses, but also illegal appropriation of welfare benefits, and we're talking about billions of dollars. Let's put that aside and let's just talk about the more serious crimes. John Lott did probably the most methodologically rigorous and comprehensive examination of this by using Arizona Department of Corrections data. Yes. And he went over a 30-year period. This was exhaustive, and this is what he does. He's a scholar. And what he showed is that illegal aliens don't just commit more crime or more serious crimes by, say, a, uh, you know, 5 percent more or 10 percent more than lawful residents, but by 250 percent more. For a long time, when I listened to, for example, people talking heads on television and, you know, at the Civil Rights Commission every once in a while someone tries to pull a fast one on us, I'm astonished by the fact that we have copious data on this. And it appears as if there are a lot of entrenched interests that want to of make course. us believe that this is not a serious issue. Americans are being slaughtered. Americans are suffering property damage in the billions of dollars. Americans are spending billions of tax dollars to address this problem, both from a law enforcement standpoint, an incarceration and, standpoint, and, by and the just way, the social you, carnage. You think we'd have the right to know? I mean, maybe Americans would decide, you know, it's worth it, actually. I want more illegal aliens here. Maybe they wouldn't, but we have a right to the information. That's why I'm so grateful that you came tonight. Peter Kirstenow, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Tucker. sounded definitive to me. We're going to talk to an anti-abortion activist who says he has collected on video damning misconduct, evidence of it, by Planned Parenthood. But the release of those videos, including on this show, has been blocked by a highly political judge. He's going to join us next to explain Your right to say what you think, which you thought was guaranteed by the Constitution, you thought it was your birthright as an American, it's under attack suddenly from all sides, mostly the left. Big tech has recently taken the lead in suppressing free expression, but they're not alone. The judiciary also doing its part to muzzle Americans. For years, David Daleiden and the Center for, Ameri for Medical Progress have ad aggravated the abortion industry by releasing videos that show abortion providers engaged in indefensible practices, like apparently haggling over the price of fetal tissue. What would you expect for intact um, tissue? What, what sort of compensation? What sort of... Well, why don't you start by telling me what you used to pay? Let's just call it choice and end the conversation. Well, that's a clip from an old video, but Dalyden says he could release many more like it. He could not, though, legally, thanks to a gag order placed by a federal judge and Democratic donor called William Oreck. He says the video somehow pose a public safety risk. David Dalyden joins us tonight. David, thank you for coming on. Um, we're interested Parker, in defending it's speech be because it's, it's under attack. Um, how does a single judge have the right to end your First Amendment right, your constitutional right to freedom of expression? He doesn't, Tucker, and that's what's so uh, blatantly unconstitutional about the gag order that Judge William Oreck, at the behest of his friends at Planned Parenthood and the National Abortion Federation, has issued against me and the Center for Medical Progress against releasing the further extensive undercover videotapes that we have of top-level Planned Parenthood abortion doctors and executives networking at the National Abortion Federation's annual meetings. These are some of the biggest abortion trade shows in America that happen every single year. And Judge Oreck, for his part, is the founder of a Planned Parenthood clinic in Northern California in San Francisco. He helped open and run and fund this Planned Parenthood clinic for many years before he was a judge, and now he's somehow the judge who is sitting in judgment over these lawsuits brought by Planned Parenthood and their proxies of the National Abortion Federation trying to shut down my freedom of speech, the freedom of speech of all pro-life Americans and really of any citizen journalist. These are some of the most damning and incriminating videotapes that we ever recorded undercover, and they're being held back right now by this biased federal judge in San Francisco. I mean, but let me, let me just say, you're always welcome to play them on this show. Even if I didn't agree with you, though I do, for the record, even if I didn't, we're against censorship, and you have a right to say what you think. How quickly does this judge justify this? How are these videos a public safety threat? Sure. 
So what Judge Oreck basically just borrowing wholesale uh, the really gross and offensive smears from the National Abortion Federation and Planned Parenthood, smearing millions of pro-life Americans across the country, saying that we're violent or saying that we somehow would threaten people. Keep in mind, in the past three years, CMP has never released a single videotape that has called for harm to anyone. Sure. We call for people to contact their elected representatives and, and officials to, to hold Planned Parenthood accountable under the law. Planned Parenthood, for their part, in the past three years, has admitted in documents that we now have that none of their abortion doctors are under threat from these videos. None of them have come to any harm because of these videos. And what they're really worried about, Tucker, is they're afraid that when the public yeah. sees what these taxpayer-funded abortion doctors are doing behind closed doors and are doing with taxpayer funding to unborn children, the kinds of transactions over body parts, right and the other kinds of cover-ups that go on, they're afraid of their business being harmed, and they're of course, afraid of their business censorship. being shut down right. because they're of the, the crimes ones, that they engage in. They're the ones who are committing violence, of course. David, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Come back anytime Thanks, with those videos. Politicians, journalists, other elites routinely call the president a dictator, but few of them, weirdly, have anything to say about China, where actual dictators reign, and millions of religious minorities face persecution. We'll discuss that next with Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, who is on that topic. Well, not a day passes when someone on the left doesn't call the president a dictator. But for some, because they're against dictators, but for some reason, they don't have much to say about China, home of actual dictators, a country whose human rights record remains atrocious even as it grows more powerful economically. In the far west of China, as many as a million Muslims have been detained in concentration camps, while Beijing has used restrictive laws and the mass immigration of ethnic Chinese to the region to stamp out their native culture. Christians, meanwhile, and other faiths face repression as well. But big tech and other American companies who do business in China don't seem to care at all. They're happy to profit from all of this. Senator Marco Rubio is one of the very few lawmakers who does care. We recently talked to him about it. Senator, that's, that's a remarkable number. A million Chinese Muslims in camps right. because the Chinese government cracks down on them because of their religion. Why, A, is that true? And B, why don't we hear more about it? It's absolutely true. In fact, uh, one of the outrages here is Google Earth. Pictures from Google Earth show us these camps. And so we read these reports about Google looking to partner up with China again, going back to China. But it's their own pictures that have revealed this reality to the world. They open these places up, they call them re-education camps, where they're basically forcing people to change their names and do all sorts of things. By the way, there's no history of radicalism among this community of Uyghurs. That's the first point. But here's the outrage. Number one, American companies and Western companies that have sold them surveillance technology that have allowed them to sort of uh, put people through some of this, including an American DNA company. Uh, they're collecting the DNA of these individuals, by the way, as well, forcefully, and, and using potentially American technology to do it. And what about the Arab world and the Muslim world and all these countries in the Middle East? Not a single one of them. You know, they're always they're the first to stand up and speak when there's a ban on travel or this or that. But they've been totally silent on this issue. And the answer is money. There's all this Chinese money flowing all over the world. They're bribing governments and in this case buying their silence on this atrocious, outrageous human rights violations that give us insight into the true nature of the regime uh, of President Xi in China. That is remarkable. So the government of Saudi Arabia, government of Egypt, two of the largest Arab governments in the world, they have not pressured China to stop no. cracking down on Muslims? No, in fact, it's not mentioned at all in international forums either. Last week, finally, for the first time, they were confronted with it, and the Chinese were forced to answer some questions by, by an uh, international organism, but not by some of these countries, many of whom have said very little of anything. And if they've said it, it's been very benign, nothing forceful. In essence, if, if there were a million people of any religion being round up anywhere in the world I, by, by a Western nation, I assure you, you would be hearing all about it, and rightfully so. But in this case, because these countries have leaders, many of whom have either taken bribes from the Chinese or that there's Chinese investment involved and promises of more money to come, they've been able to buy their silence. Hypocrisy, outrageous, unacceptable. And, and I'm glad that this administration is looking into doing something about it. But you often hear Democratic lawmakers, including in your body, the Senate, stand up and say this administration is mistreating Muslims. They haven't said anything about this. Why? 
Well, I think there's a general lack of awareness, the first is. The second, I think, it, it, look, I, we talked about this before on your program, and I'm glad you pay so much attention to it. We, a significant percentage of the American people are starting to wake up to the reality that for the first time since 1991, we have a near-peer competitor in the world, and that's China. They don't seek to compete with us. They seek to yeah. overtake us, to replace us in the world. And sadly, we still have American corporations and companies that are so interested in doing business and making money in China that they don't care about it. So you, you have tech companies that won't partner with the Pentagon on defense projects, but partner with the Chinese university that works for their military and, and, and who want us to cave on. I call the president at least once a week and just continue to encourage him because he's, it's the first time any administration has finally stood up to China after years and years of abuse and looking the other way. Senator, thanks for all the work you've done in this. I appreciate well, it. Thank you for the attention you pay to this issue. Well, it is time for this week's final exam. Kay Pavlich, as you know, has been a whirlwind of a contestant. She's won eight times in a row. Can she win tonight and tie Shannon Bream's all-time record? You will find out after this break, so don't go away, as they used to say. Time now for final exam, where we assemble two television news experts, pit one against one another to see who's been paying closest attention to the news. Katie Pavlich, of course, has won eight matches in a row. She's from Town Hall. She is a one-woman Roman legion, <laughs> crushing all opponents. If she wins tonight, she will tie Shannon Bream for the longest winning streak on this show. Here's everybody she has faced and defeated so far. Look at those, Rich Edson. Rich Edson is her challenger tonight. He's Fox News Washington correspondent and a brave man. You ready? I mean, do I need to do this? Or? <laughs> yes, you do. You're, <laughs> just, you're roped in. But you know what? You never fun. know. Right. You never know. Everybody has a shot. That's It's like playing a lotto. Right. You can't win if you don't play. Okay. Here are the rules. Doubtless you're familiar, but for those who aren't, hands on buzzers. I ask the questions. The first one to buzz in gets to answer the question. You must wait until I finish asking the question in order to answer. You, you can answer once I acknowledge by saying your name. Each correct answer is worth a single point. If you get it wrong, you lose a point from your total best of five wins. Simple math. You ready? Ready. Okay. First question, multiple choice. Until this week, Michael Jackson's Thriller was the best-selling musical album of all time. Which band's album just surpassed it by going platinum 38 times? Was it A, The Rolling Stones? Was it B, Bon Jovi? Was it C, The Eagles? Katie Pavlich. See the Eagles. The Eagles? Yes. The 70s supergroup? Oh, absolutely. Let's see if it's the Eagles. The Eagles. Yes. Greatest Hits, 1971 to 1975, is the new best-selling album of all time. Oh. The record has sold more than 38 million copies since it was released Jeez. in 1976. Wow. I sent the story to my parents. More than rumors by Fleetwood Mac. How'd you know that? Because my parents are the biggest Eagles fans on the planet. And so wow. I grew up listening to the Eagles, so I'm also a fan. Interesting. I'm from okay. Jersey. I'm contractually obligated to guess Bon Jovi, so I <laughs> Of course. It, it worked out, it worked out just fine so for it's, me. It's very different. Right. Okay. True. Question two, another multiple choice. Forbes just released its list of 2018's highest paid actors. Despite not putting out any movies, which star took the top spot due to a lucrative liquor deal? Was it A, Johnny Depp, B, George Clooney, C, Tom Hanks? Rich Edson, ladies and gentlemen. Clooney. Clooney, a lucrative liquor deal. Sure. That doesn't sound like the George Clooney I know. Roll the tape. Tequila has sent George Clooney to the top of the best Good paid margaritas. actors list. The Ford's best. annual <laughs> ranking puts his earnings Costas at $239 million. A large portion of Clooney's cash came from selling his Casamigos Tequila Company for a billion dollars last year. Is that just year. spending money at that point? Or yeah. At that yeah. Point. So everything's free for him. Walk around. Another yeah. place on Lake Como. Question three. A kind woman with a very special job is all over the internet after she threw out a wicked first pitch at a Major League Baseball game. What is the woman's occupation in real life? Katie Pavlich. She is a nun. She's a nun? Yes, she is a nun. You sure? I'm sure. Check the tape, please. Call her the holy thrower. This nun is going viral for her first, first pitch at the White Sox game over the weekend. I remember from ZCD. They can throw. They know what they're doing. They can. <laughs> A ruler arm, yeah. really. Oh, that's pretty funny. All right, two to one, going into question four. This is another multiple choice question. There is a company in Minnesota that's offering paid leave to workers to look after new pets. 
What is the name of this type of benefit? Is it A, fraternity leave, B, sacatical, or C, petcation? Katie Pavlich. Fraternity leave. Is, <laughs> that is too good. I hope that's the one. Is it fraternity leave? Fraternity leave. Oh, the God. policy allows employees to work from that. home for up you to a week that? after adopting a new <laughs> animal. A dog. The company says I pets are just as important to their workers' <laughs> families as human babies. If reptiles? I was running a business and someone called in for fraternity leave, <laughs> I would fire them on the spot. <laughs> Do you know what? I would give someone fraternity leave for paternity leave. I would. I'm sorry. I'm sure I'll get hate mail. I, I mean, agree with that I mean completely. That. Yes. Thank you so much, Tucker. I appreciate your sympathy. Uh, I'm pro dog. <laughs> Final question a political question for you. Which 38 year old resident of the White House now wants to run for office despite rejecting the idea multiple times in past years? Current resident? 38 year old former resident of the White House now wants to Rich Edson. Is it Chelsea Clinton? Is it Chelsea Clinton? Last year, Chelsea Clinton said she didn't Correct. want to run for office. Nobody I believed her. And it one. turns out all of us were right. Oh, now she smokes. says she is, quote, a definite maybe to line. run for office. The real message of the 2016 election is that Americans want a permanent hereditary political gr uh, class drawn from the same three or four families. Rich Sesson coming up a point short, but doing so with Good job. I didn't know the last honor question. and dignity. It was a nice ending, I have to say. Thank and you. I can't Thank say that about so all the people Thank Katie you. has crushed. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was great. Katie, yet another Eric yet Wemple another. commemorative <laughs> mug. This mug, of course, memorializes his appearance, his only appearance on this show. We never forget. You now officially tie Shannon Bream. We're going to talk to our judges about what we're going to do about that. We're going to have a showdown. Probably a showcase showdown. All right, here we go, people. Tune in. Bill Todd's in Mark Goodman Production. That's it for final exam this week. Pay attention to the news all week. Tune in every Thursday to see if you can outwit the experts, meaning Katie Pavlich and possibly Shannon Bream. We'll be right back. Well, the purge of thought crime continues across the major tech platforms. PragerU has quality, thought-provoking videos on a lot of topics, but they generally lean right of center, nothing crazy basically right of center. So Facebook has been suppressing their videos because it's just too much for them, including this one defending the virtues of masculinity. When you try to make men more like women, you don't get less toxic masculinity. You get more. The devaluation of masculinity won't end well because feminine passive men don't stop evil. Passive men don't defend, protect, or provide. Healthy families and strong communities depend on the leadership and bravery of good men. Yet, the current trend is to feminize young men in the hopes of achieving some utopian notion of equality and peace. It's not masculinity that's toxic. It's the lack of it. By the way, that's totally true. And that was a sum total of it. There was no graphic violence, no threats, no burning crosses. And yet Facebook blocked its users from seeing that video. Ultimately, they apologized after there was an outcry, but they did that, which tells you a lot. Allie Stuckey is the host who you just saw in that video. She joins us tonight. So, Allie, was there something that we didn't play? Was there more that was deeply offensive? No, that was it. You played the most radical part, this idea that good, strong men make for a good, strong society. Uh, several of PragerU's videos were censored, like you said. Only two of them were taken down. This was one of them. Uh, the specific reasoning for this, they said, was that it constituted as hate speech. Of course, after PragerU uh, brought this up on Twitter, they apologized. They said it was a mistake, and they put it back up. But, of course, you have to wonder how many mistakes Facebook uh, can make exclusively at the expense of conservative voices before it's deliberate. Did they define hate speech? They throw the term around. I have no idea what it means. Did they tell you? No. No, of course not. And that's really what the troubling part about this is this expansion of the word hate. Um, their Orwellian uh, kind of monopoly on terms like love, hate, right and wrong. Right. Um, that's what we're seeing from Facebook, exclusively censoring conservatives. That's unbelievable. Did I, I know they've censored other PragerU videos. They sincerely told you this was just a, an absolute mistake. We had no idea how this happened. Did they have a, a rational explanation? 
Uh, no, they didn't at all because once PragerU brought it up on Twitter, it got thousands and thousands of retweets. I guess Facebook realized this was going to be a bigger deal than they wanted to actually address. So they said this was a mistake. We apologize and they put the video back up. Of course, by then a lot of the damage had been done. It probably lost millions of views at that point. It was a new video, uh, but they never actually explained their justification for deleting it. It'd be nice if Congress kind of acted to protect the rest of us from this, but I guess they're they're too busy doing something else. Allie, that uh, that's an amazing story. Thank you for telling it to us. Thanks, Tucker. That's it for us tonight. Sadly, we are completely out of time, and yet we will be back tomorrow. We hope you will be too to the show that is the sworn enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and especially groupthink, which is everywhere. You have to fight back, or you will become a robot.